yeah, the recording will restart once again. Um, so we have uh, looked in John chapter 16 up to verse 18. And uh, we st kind of started looking at uh, verse 19 onwards. Um, so we saw the imagery being used over here of a woman giving birth. Uh, so the Jew disciples are very concerned about the duration of this in a little while. You know, I will be, I will, you will not see me anymore. So they are worried about that. So Jesus says it's very insignificant amount of time. Do not worry. It is like a woman giving birth. Um, now, when she's going through that, it may feel like a very long period of time. Uh, but once uh, the child is delivered, new life is brought forth. She will even forget that she went through any anguish, um, is what it says in verse 21. So in, in verse 22, he says, it will be the same with you. Now is your time of grief. So yes, you will feel grief for an insignificant period of time. But after that, great will be your rejoicing. And uh, so we thought we would look at a, uh, uh, an, uh, a verse which talks about this bringing forth of new life. Uh, that would be Romans chapter 8, verses 22 to 23. So if someone could read out 22 to 23. Haven't people returned from their break? Could someone read out Romans 8, 22 to 23? So I'll say you have sorrow now, but I'll see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. I'm so sorry. I meant Romans 8, 22 to 23. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Romans 8? 22 to 23. Mm -hmm. I got it. Um, For we know that the whole creation has been growing together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we, we were saved. Now, yeah, hope... yeah that, that, that should be enough. Uh, so over here, it talks about how there is a groaning going on in the present. The whole world is groaning because, you know, uh, uh, the world is deteriorating. It's not in the kind of um, original condition that it was in when God first created it. Uh, so there's decay and uh, um, all of creation is uh, longing for a renewal. And uh, so uh, in the same way, it says even believers, they are also longing to receive what has been promised. Uh, we are still stuck in the physical body and we have we are suffering all the limitations of living in a uh, human body that was corrupted by sin and decay. So we too are longing for this. And um, so over here it talks about how uh, it's as if we are uh, waiting for that moment when new life will come forth. And the point over here is that once that new life comes, it will be something so grand and so great that what we are going through now will seem so insignificant. We'll not even remember it. We'll not even think about it anymore. Uh, so I wanted to specifically bring up that uh, you know passage over here um, because uh, what John chapter 16 is offering us is something very beautiful. You know, Jesus says, uh, when you're going through that, it may feel like a long time. It may feel so, like uh, something very unbearable and too painful. But when that new life which has been promised comes through, what is what you're going through now will not even matter. And uh, so in that context, we can you know, take, uh, uh, you know, take comfort in uh, Romans 8, 22 to 23. It's true that we are still in the human body. It's true that we have not yet been, uh, um, you know, uh, received transformed bodies and we are not yet in the in God's presence but when that happens 
all the persecutions that we went through over here for the faith, um, all the acts of sacrifice which we had to make, you know, uh, to stay loyal to the Lord and to obey Him, all of that will feel like a micron. Um, it will feel like a very insignificant little thing because what is coming is so great and majestic in glory, and uh, we will be participants in that. Uh, that this what we have gone through here in this earth will seem like a micron, something so insignificant, not to be even thought about. Uh, so we can have that uh, confidence and assurance. So in, in 20, verse 22, Jesus is specifically talking about the crucifixion, of course. And he says, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. So to an extent, you know, we could apply that to ourselves in this uh, and, and say, you know, now we may be going through a time of grief and hardship uh, where we have to undergo suffering so that we can remain true to the Lord, uh, serve him and honor him, uh, take up our cross and follow him. But uh, a day will come, you know, in the future uh, when we will literally see the great will be our joy. So, of course, here the immediate context is not that. Here Jesus is just talking about the crucifixion and how after he is raised from the dead, they will see him again. Um, moving on to verses 23 to 27. Uh, yes, if someone could read out. Verses which are full of hope. Uh, very beautiful verses. 23 to 27. And truly that day you ask nothing of me. Truly I say to you, Whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Uh, 25 to 27. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will answer my name. I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Okay, so um, the main point that Jesus is making here is that, you know, you will not have to come to me and uh, uh, ask things from me. You can directly go to the Father. Uh, and, I um, mean, you know, we have some people even today, they're saying, you know, that we need to have an intercessor. We need to have the saints uh, speaking on our behalf to God. Uh, and they say, you know, we, you need to go to Mary and then Mary will intercede on your behalf and present your requests to the Lord. All of those things are said by, by you know, different factions. Uh, but here, Jesus says, you don't even have to come to me to ask anything. You can just directly go to the Father because this work of atonement which Jesus is going to do on the cross, it will atone for our sins and we will be declared righteous and we will have direct access to the Father directly. And uh, so it says in verse 23, in that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. You just have to take my name and when you approach the Father in my name, um, you know, you will you will be able to be received by him, welcomed by him. And he repeats that once again. He says in verse 26 and 27, in that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. He says, I don't even have to do an intercession. I don't have to go and ask on your behalf. You just directly go ask him in my name. Why? Because the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So these people have made a commitment to Jesus, have placed their faith in him. And now they are standing on his name and claiming in his name. So because of that, because of the trust that they have placed in the Lord Jesus, the father loves them. He now considers them his own family. So we don't even need that little bit of intercession where Jesus is you know, going on our behalf and saying, oh Lord, please do this for these people. We can directly go to him, uh, go to the father ourselves and say in the name of Jesus, in the name of all that he has done for me on the cross, I now come to you and I'm making my request. And the Father says, yes, you are loved. You are accepted. You don't need any other intercessor. I will directly give you what you need. Uh, so it, it's a very beautiful passage. Uh, so, you know, especially when you're going through something very tough and you're feeling very alone, um, remember this. You're in a position where not even Jesus has to intercede for you. 
just go directly to the Father in the name of Jesus. And because of what Jesus has done on the cross, you will be granted direct access and the Lord will give you what you require for your circumstances, for your situations. Um, and uh, over here, when it talks about in Jesus name, you know, because now we have the same goals that Jesus has. Uh, we have the same mission uh, that Jesus has. So we are kind of in sync with him. Uh, we are uh, united with him. And so um, the father will feel that it's quite OK to give us what we need because we are asking in line with the character of Jesus. We are not being selfish or self-centered. Self, uh, self uh, we are asking in line with the plans of Jesus you know, and the, and the plans of the father. So um, when it says in Jesus' name, we ask something that will honor the name of Jesus. We are asking something that would be in line with his will. And so the father will uh, definitely grant it to us. Uh, so uh, when Jesus says in verse 26, I am not saying that I will ask the father on your behalf. No, the father himself loves you. Uh, so uh, we don't even need that kind of an intercession because our love for Jesus and the faith which we have placed in his finished work on the cross because we trust that when we just go in jesus name it will be done for us because we have that much faith in the work of the cross so whenever you pray whatever on earth you're praying for remember the work done on the cross because that is at the core of everything this whole relationship that we have with god at the core of it is this work on the cross and that work on the cross was so complete that um uh, that there is no limitation to what we can receive. Uh, there are uh, no uh, limitations that God sets in how much love he is going to extend towards us. Uh, it is all unlimited because of that work on the cross. So to what extent do I trust the work, the finished work of the cross? Do I really believe that uh, you know there can be healing uh, for my sicknesses and you know, for the sicknesses of my family members? because of that work of the cross? Do I really believe that he will provide me with the things that I need on a day-to-day -day basis? Do I really believe that he will equip me for the ministry that he has given me? Um, you know, so how, to what extent do I believe in this work on the cross? If we truly believe that total victory was won on that cross and that now in him, uh, we can have all that we require to live an abundant life, then if we have that kind of faith, then Jesus, uh, then the Father will never deny us our requests because we are asking in Jesus' name, truly believing that He has accomplished all those things for us. So it's a very powerful passage, uh, which is talking about walking into God's presence, into the Father's presence with complete confidence and faith. Uh, moving on to verse 33, the last verse. If someone could read out that. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. So even it's, uh, this weekend, you know, when I was just um, uh, sharing the word somewhere, uh, a person asked, you know, why, why is God allowing all of these uh, uh, terrible things to happen to us? You know, why is God not protecting us? Uh, and, uh, because... Uh, Jesus promised that he would give us an abundant life. And uh, so I, I, this was the verse that I was reminded of. And I was just sharing with that person. Uh, you know, I said, uh, what does Jesus say over here? He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Okay, so um, trials would be there. In this world, you will have trouble. Uh, there is no doubt about it. God promises that there will be trouble in this world. But when we are in the, in the midst of these troubles, through him, in him, we can still overcome. We can still feel strong and we can hold on in faith and uh, wait for the you know, dark tunnel to end because there will be an end to the dark tunnel. He will bring us out on the other side. And till that happens, we can be in him strengthen ourselves in him, believe in what he has said and hold on to that. And he will give us the strength that we require to go through that tunnel till we come out at the other end. Uh, so we have this assurance. Um, 
And uh, one thing that was mentioned in your textbook, uh, it says over there, peace is offered to us, but tribulation is promised. So the promise uh, is that you will have trials and troubles on this earth because this is a fallen world that we are living in. And God is allowing the prince of the air to continue having some level of power and control even though he has been completely defeated. So if anyone takes a stand against him in the name of Jesus and says, you know what, I already know the fact. The fact is that all your works were cancelled on the cross. So you can't really have a, any hold over me and my life. So if you take that stand, then he'll, he'll have to back off. But for all the poor ignorant people who still do not know these truths, he can still continue having a hold over them simply because they still haven't been told about this truth. And they're still under the lies of the evil one. So yes, to an extent, you know, we will have trials and difficulties because we are living in that kind of a setup where people are still blinded and they're still being controlled by him and they do things which are evil and sinful. And because of that, we suffer and we struggle and we go through trials. So all of this is promised by God, but peace is being offered. In the midst of all of this, you and I can choose, we can opt to have peace by choosing to be in him, where we hold on to his scriptures and really believe them and say, I know I'm going through this right now, but the scripture says that he will deliver me. The scripture says that he will strengthen me. And so I will be able to come, go, you know, go through this successfully and come out from the other side. Um, you know, so we can have this deep assurance. So the peace is being offered. We can choose to live in that peace by you know by being in him or we can continue to worry and be anxious and all of that so the choice would be ours moving on to john chapter 17 um this is the prayer that jesus is praying and he is committing his people into the father's hands uh, not just the disciples but all the disciples who will come later on through the centuries including you and me so this is a prayer which he is praying for us, not just for John and uh, Paul and Peter. Uh, of, of, of course, Paul was not one of the 12 disciples. But yeah, he's, this is not a prayer just for them. It's even for us who are living here today. Uh, so it, this should be of interest to us because the things that he prays for over here, they apply even to you and me. Um, so if someone could begin by, by reading out verse 1, John 17, 1. When Jesus had spoken his words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Okay, so um, he begins with the wording, uh, glorify your son. Sounds like a very selfish request. But immediately after that, he says that your son may glorify you. Okay, so uh, when a person is really praying from their heart, it shows what they are like on the inside. A prayer can reveal a lot about a person. Now, there are prayers that we pray in public and we are kind of guarded in what we say. But, you know, when you're alone in God's presence, down on your knees and, uh, you know, just kind of observe the prayer that you're praying, it will reveal a lot of things about you as a person. Uh, what is your faith level? What do you really believe? Uh, what are your expectations? Uh, what actually are the desires of your heart, the real, you know, the bottom line ambitions, you know, the, 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 the core of your being, all of those things get revealed in, a, in the prayer. Um, so the next time when you're praying, just kind of look at your prayer and say, okay, what does this reveal about me? And in fact, it would, it would in fact show a lot about us, you know. So um, here, Jesus is making a prayer uh, from the bottom of his heart and uh, we see that the first thing that we see about his, about what he is like on the inside, he is not asking God to glorify him so that you know he can promote himself. Rather, he is asking God to glorify him so that the Father may be glorified. Um, he is not uh, being um, self-focused, but rather he is being Father-focused, and we should have that same attitude because you know when we are in um, living this life and we go through different situations. Uh, we can uh, ask God to glorify us with two kinds of motives. One is where uh, 
you know, we want to be able to say, look, I'm going through these hard times and still look at the way I know I'm, I'm uh, overcoming all of it. You know, I'm really great. I'm really strong. And I think you people should really observe that, note that and, you know, uh, admire me for who I am. So it could be in a kind of very selfish, self-centered, boastful way that we ask God to glorify us. Um, you know, in, in our difficult circumstances so that we can show off how strong and spiritual we are. On the other hand, we can say, Lord, I'm going through this terrible time and I'm asking that you glorify me in this situation so that people who are watching will see what kind of a God you are, that you're someone who comes for, to the helpless and um, does the impossible for them and brings them out of their situations then they will know who you are and what kind of a God you are. And they will want to honor you and glorify you and accept you in the same way that I have accepted you. Uh, so uh, it is quite all right to ask the Lord to glorify us when we are going through a very difficult situation. Um, in, in the sense, when you're using the word glory over there, we're saying, you know, do something spectacular, Lord, you know, strengthen me in a great way where I will be able to go through this without breaking down and um, also glorify in the sense, do something um, impossible so that I uh, you know to turn the situation around. So it is all right to ask God to glorify us in a difficult situation, <clears throat> but the motives of the heart would be very, very important. Am I doing it just to show off how spiritual and strong I, I am? Or am I asking this so that people can see what kind of a God I serve. And uh, so I would rejoice at the victory which you know follows. And even they would rejoice and say, wow, what a God. Look at the way he you know, looks after his people. So um, here we have Jesus asking uh, the Father to glorify him with all the correct motives in mind. Um, uh, verses 2 to 3, if Yes, this oh, this is very important. Uh, a very, very important uh, doctrinal point is being made here. Um, John chapter 17, verses 2 to 3, if someone could read out. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that you should give it on a life with many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Uh, it's like a definition of eternal life that's being given over here. Uh, now, this is eternal life. What is it? It is to know the only true God and to know Jesus Christ, whom this true God has sent. That is eternal life. Um, so over here, when it says know that uh, eternal life is to know God and Jesus, that knowing over there is not just a, um, intellectual knowledge, because even the demons know, you know, God and Jesus, uh, but it has not done them any good. Uh, so uh, it's an experiential knowing. The Greek word used over there is genosko, uh, which talks about more something that you know out of experience, where you are, you know, um, believing in Him, trusting Him. And uh, you are discovering day by day that he is indeed the true God and that the words which Jesus have spoken are indeed really true. Uh, so through experience, uh, you're kind of getting to know him. So in the beginning, you just trust him and you make a commitment and you enter into that relationship with him. And after you've entered into that relationship, you continue growing in your knowledge of him. Uh, so you are, you're now walking in this eternal life that you have, you know, uh, entered into. Once that commitment is made to the Lord, once you say, Lord, I believe in you and now I'm submitting to you, please take over my life. He comes into our lives. And from that moment on, you are now walking in eternal life, you know. And uh, so what is this eternal life where you just get to know more, get to know him more and more now? For many, many years, uh, for a huge chunk of my life, I never really understood this. You see, for me, eternal life, um, knowing God was, uh, was just the means to an end. I, want an, I wanted an abundant life. I wanted to be blessed. 
I wanted things to go well for me. And so my idea was that, OK, if I know God, if I know this Jesus, then I will have the end product, which is, you know, blessings and an abundant life and, uh, you know, good things. You know, so uh, the end goal was the blessings and, you know, okay, of course, a ticket to heaven and all of that. Um, but here, something so important is being told. Eternal life is not having the blessings and the ticket. Eternal life is him, knowing him. He himself is the final goal. And uh, this is such a, you know, important revelation uh, because a lot of Christians uh, come to Jesus the same way they would come to Santa Claus. Um, you see, Santa Claus is not important. He's just this plump man in a red uh, suit. He's not important. What he can give is important. So people go to Santa uh, and um, in the hope that they will get this bigger thing, this greater thing, this gift from him. But nobody thinks of Santa as the gift because he's just the means to the end. Uh, but over here, we discover God himself is the gift. And it's something that maybe we don't really realize at the beginning of our walk, you know, with the Lord. But as we start getting to know him and how beautiful he is, we start realizing that he himself is the gift. I mean, what if you had everything in the world and you didn't have him? How, uh, I don't know, alone we would be. Because we constantly have his presence and his love and this uh, deep assurance of belonging, you know, that I am his. He's there for me. And uh, he loves me. He believes in me in spite of all my failures. And he wants to lift my head high. He wants to give me a purpose in my life. Uh, he wants to, he, he, he's always making plans, you know, for me uh, that I can walk in, uh, deeds that I can fulfill. I have all of this in him. So he's, he, he is uh, somebody precious to know. And if I just simply have all the things and I don't have him, uh, life would be so empty. So um, eternal life is not just having this abundant life or having the blessings or having a uh, entry into heaven. Um, eternal life is literally knowing him, being with him. And you know that's why someone uh, once said, "Oh, how boring! Once we get to heaven, all we have to do is st stand over there and praise." Is it? They, they don't get the point. Uh, once you get over there, you, all you will actually want to do is just be there in with him because it's so amazing. He is so amazing that you will not want anything more. You'll just want to be there in his presence and, and, and enjoy him. So um, he's not the means to an end. He is the end goal itself. Uh, so eternal life is literally knowing him and have a, having a personal relationship with him. Uh, so the other day I was uh, reading uh, the book of Ephesians. And um, where is it? In Ephesians chapter 4, I think. You know, in verse 17, it says over there, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, um, Paul is telling the Ephesian believers to pray this prayer. And he says to them, ask God for the spirit of revelation and um, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know God better you know so um uh, when i read that i thought wow this is such a lovely prayer to pray because if i ask god for the spirit of wisdom and revelation he will start revealing himself even more and more because the more you know him the more you discover how beautiful he is and uh, uh, then you will not really want the other things that much anymore he becomes the central focus so i think it's a prayer that we all really need to pray ask God for the spirit of wisdom and revelation because once you receive that you begin to see more of him and you begin to enjoy him more and everything else becomes secondary and kind of fades into the background of course we still need the other things because we're in a human body and we need to live uh, so yes those are important and the Lord will provide but the central focus becomes uh, God himself and we uh, discover that we taste and see that he is indeed very very good OK, so a uh, very significant uh, truth being conveyed over here. This is eternal life, that uh, you genosco him, experientially know him, know the true God, and know Jesus Christ, whom he has uh, sent. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, another point that maybe we could bring out from, from this, uh, eternal life is knowing 
the only true God and Jesus Christ. Because all religions claim to know God, uh, but they have not had a Genosco experiential uh, knowledge of Yahweh and Jesus Christ. They say that they know God in general. Okay, they're talking about a general head knowledge, but an experiential uh, knowledge uh, where you literally are experiencing Him on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that can only happen with this Creator God who has created humans. Only He can reveal Himself to people in that way, and only through Jesus can that happen. So um, uh, religions can only offer some kind of a head knowledge. They can never ever provide an experiential genosco knowledge where you literally have a walk, a life with that, with, with God, with Him. You know, so um, yeah, these are some points that we could bring out uh, from this particular passage. Uh, maybe we can look at uh, verses four and five. Yeah, if someone could read out verses four and five. I have glorified you on the, on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Yes, so here Jesus says, um, you know, that he is going to be finishing the work for which he has been sent. Uh, he completes it, even though it means that it's going to cost him his life. It doesn't matter. Uh, even to the point of death, uh, he is willing to finish the work which has been given to him. And once that is completed, he is not going to be earning, you know, glory by doing this. No, because he already had the glory. He was always God. He always had that uh, uh, equal glory with the Father, you know, in his pre-incarnate state. So he only gave it up for a temporary time so that he could come and do this work on behalf of human beings. Uh, but when he goes back, it's not that glory. He's not going to get glory because he has earned it through the cross. No. The cross is something that he has done for us, not for his benefit. He always had glory, and he would reclaim that uh, greater glory. Um, and then uh, if we can maybe look at verses 6 to 8, if someone could read out, please. I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Amen. Yes. So here he starts off by saying, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me. Uh, so it's not just information that Jesus conveyed. He acted it out. He manifested it. He, uh, he showed in action what the character of God is like. Uh, because, you know, we have that um, uh, verse in John 14, 9. Uh, you know, where Philip is asking, you know, show us the Father. And then Jesus says, very frankly, he says, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus reveals the Father to them in a in a very real way through his actions, through his speech, uh, through his priorities. Uh, so everything about Jesus automatically shows what the Father is like. So... Um, he has revealed the Father to them in a, in a very clear, um, practical manner where he has acted out what the Father is like. What is the, he, has, he has shown what the character of God is like. And um, so having seen that, the, the disciples have chosen to believe in him. They have recognized uh, that indeed Jesus is from God and that Jesus is like God. Uh, you know, so they have accepted that. So that is why Jesus says over here, uh, they have uh, obeyed your word. You know, they have kept your word. Um, and um, yeah, uh, moving on quickly to verses 9 and 10. 
yeah, that's a nice point over here. Nine and ten, if we could read. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those who. You have given me for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and yours are in them. Yes. Uh, so here, um, Jesus is differentiate, distinguishing between the world and the people uh, who have been given to him, you know, his followers, uh, by on the basis of whom they belong to. So the people of the world, they don't belong to the Father. On the other hand, the followers of Jesus, they belong to him. So um, um, the ones who have a personal relationship with the Father, uh, they are the ones uh, who will you know, receive glory one day. They are the ones, um, it says in verse 10, you know, it says, all I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me uh, through them. So the way we live, it will glorify the Father. It will glorify the Son. And in turn, the Lord will you know, glorify us uh, when the time comes to for our reward. So all of this happens because of this personal belonging, this relationship that we have with him. So the other religions, they are not offering that. They are not bringing you into a relationship where you personally belong to God and are considered by him, by this creator, uh, as his own family members. That belongingness, uh, none of these religions are offering. They just talk about different ways that you can try to reach out to him and get things from him. Uh, but a uh, kind of personal relationship, that belongingness, uh, that is not uh, really offered by any of the other religions. Um, verses 11 and 12. Yeah, maybe we can read verses 11 and 12. And I, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, not one of them has been lost the Yeah, it talks about um, uh, Judas over here. Um, and it says, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction. Um, the word over there is, you know, uh, son of destruction in, in some translations. Uh, over there, so, so the Greek word that is being used over there is um, someone who is completely given over to evil. Okay, so this person who was completely given over to evil, uh, that person has not been saved. But Jesus says, all the others, I have kept them safe. And now Jesus is no longer going to be physically present to keep them sa safe. And so he prays this prayer in verse 11. He says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. So always have great confidence in that power of his name, uh, you know. Um, on our own, uh, we will not be able to stand. On our own, we will um, not be able to hold on to the faith and always be obedient and submissive and always have the strength to take up the cross and follow him. All these things we cannot do on our own. But when we are failing and you know we, uh, we feel bad about how we have failed, always remember, uh, this prayer where Jesus prayed, it still stands. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. So yes, it is true that there are, there are going to be times when we fail, when we are going to be foolish and stupid and you know uh, forget the scriptures and do something uh, dumb. But remember, uh, Jesus prayed this prayer not just for those disciples, but even for you and me. And the prayer was that protect them by the power of your name. So the Lord with his power, uh, by his strength, he will bring us back. He will restore us. Um, I remember times in my life when I felt such a failure. I was trying so hard to be a good believer, but all I was doing is failing. And I sometimes used to think, my goodness, will I ever change? You know, Will I ever improve? 
and i would just cry out and say lord you know you said in in jude you know in the book of jude uh, that uh, he will keep us you know that he will keep us to the end so i would say lord you made that uh, promise so uh, you know I, I i even though i'm not doing too well now i know i will grow you will cause me to grow your spirit is who is working in me will strengthen me so never ever you know um, feel so discouraged where you give up because that is what happens with some believers it's very sad it's a lie of the devil the devil says to them look you're so caught up in sin and you're such a mess uh, you you will never be able to get out you will never grow strong you will never have a walk with the lord not you you know and when a person starts believing that they just give up they just start living in sin and it and they get into bondage you know it's like they're a prisoner once again they're a slave once again and uh, it's such a miserable existence uh, so never ever believe that stupid lie of the satan that uh, you know you can never come out no know that the father that, that jesus christ prayed to the holy father and said protect them by the power of your name so the lord will do that for each one of us and we have so many verses we know in the new testament which talk about how god will keep us but maybe we could, we could just uh, look at uh, the verse in uh, you know jude um uh, uh, yeah where you have uh, verse 24 the last verse in the book of jude if someone okay not the last verse the second last verse if someone could read out that please verse Jude, 24 Jude yes. 24 now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy amen i always just hold on to the scripture because you know even of course even now i keep failing and uh, uh, each time i i you know fall i say no no lord uh this is not going to be my destiny you know you have brought me so far i'm an, i'm not the mess i used to be uh really the lord has been so merciful so in the same way i have come all this way and uh, god has done this work in my life he will continue to do his work because it says over here one day he will present us uh, you know without blemish we will stand there in, in god's presence without blemish we will continue to grow in him he will continue to keep us uh, from falling so we will fall uh, you know less and less we will grow more uh, so we can have this deep assurance that the prayer which jesus prayed on that day to the father the father has heard and he is going to apply that prayer to every believer so by the power of his name we will be able to walk in him we will not fall away we can have this assurance um yeah uh, we have uh, shay who has raised his hand please go ahead brother and uh, no you do not have a question if you have a question you can go ahead and ask or forever hold your peace or, or i can't hear you is it okay maybe it was just uh, by mistake that he pressed on it we'll uh, yeah we have um, no, about 7 minutes um, so uh, maybe we could read out verses 17 18 19 John seventeen. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, and that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for this only, but also for those who believe. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, that 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 should be it. Uh, so it is, uh, you know. if you if we want to stay in the lord if we want to grow in the lord there is no shortcut you get sanctified by the truth you know your word is truth and so we would have to follow his word we would have to believe in it to the extent where we are willing to practice it uh, if we don't we can never get sanctified so you see there is no shortcut god is not just going to wave a wand from heaven and turn you into a super believer um it, it does not work that way on a day to day basis you have to believe in his word you have to say yeah the lord is for me the things that i'm going through are difficult uh, but you know through your suffering you have to hold on 
and uh, say, no, I will stand on his word because he is there for me. He will do good for me. So you have to hold on to him. And even as you're holding on to the truth and trying to keep it in that process, you know, there's greater and greater sanctification happening. And the word sanctification just basically means God is setting you apart more and more for his enjoyment, for his pleasure. And uh, when he takes pleasure in you, uh, you also will enjoy that because you will enjoy his presence. Uh, you will enjoy having that close uh, fellowship with him. Uh, so the word is vital. You have to believe it to the extent where you're willing to uh, take chances, make sacrifices, and hold on and follow it and practice it. Because as you are doing that, God sets you apart for himself more and more, and you're able to enjoy more of him. And uh, then you would begin to feel that your life is abundant. You may not have all the wealth in the world and all the position and influence in the world, but you will feel so rich inside. You will feel so satisfied inside. Uh, you know, so uh, it, it is vital because sanctification takes place through the truth. So there is no shortcut. You would have to hold on to the truth and, uh, you know, follow his word. Now, uh, coming to the last section, uh, that would be verses 21 uh, to 20, 26. Um, here, Jesus is you know, repeating many of the things that were uh, said earlier. He, uh, he talks mainly about unity, the importance of unity. Um, uh, and uh, so maybe what key verse can we look at in this unity passage? Um, maybe we could have uh, someone read out verses 23 and 24. 23, I, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Amen. So over here, um, you know, Jesus is talking about I in them and you in me. Um, um, okay, the, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. He's, he's talking about this uh, relationship that he has with the Father. You know, it is a relationship that is based on uh, love. Uh, between the father and the son, but it's also humility because the father, the Jesus is willing to submit and humble himself, even though he's equal with the father. Uh, he's always uh, looking to honor the father, glorify him rather than, you know, glorifying himself. Um, and uh, whatever the father wants spoken, whatever the father wants done, he's willing to do that. So his, his mission is um, in sync with the father's. So all of these are elements which bring about a deep unity between the Father and the Son. So in the same way, in the same way that Jesus is in um, is in the Father and the Father is in Jesus, he wants the believers to also have that same kind of a relationship. He says, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. So we, we believers would have to walk in the same things, in all of these elements that we see displayed in the relationship of the father and son. Uh, we would have to love each other. Uh, we would have to be willing to humble ourselves and submit to each other. And you know, we have scriptures for all of this, right? Um, ouch. Um, someone could mute themselves. Um, yeah. So even as we, uh, you know, follow the same pattern uh, that uh, that Jesus is presenting here, uh, then we would be able to walk in unity. One point that I wanted to make, you know, and then we could actually close uh, in verse 22. It says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is saying, uh, Father, I have given these believers, these disciples, the glory that you gave me. So you see, all the followers of Jesus have been given the same level of glory. All of them are going to be confirmed to the image of the Son to the same extent. 
it's not like as if some people are going to be made more like the sun and some people are going to be made less like the son of god no we are all have the same status we have all been given the same amount of glory so we don't really need to be jealous of one another at all uh, because that is what you know creates disunity sometimes where believers are jealous of of others uh, they think oh what god has given them is something extra special and what god has given me is not good enough and uh, uh, but uh, we see that whatever god has given he has done it you know because you know, romans 8 you know 29 to 30 where it talks about how we are all predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son and it goes on to say in verse 30 um, you know he he justified us and those he has justified he also glorified uh, so whatever is required for our walk with god all of that is being given to each one of us we don't have to look at someone else and think oh they have been given a better deal no based on the purposes which you will be fulfilling in your life for the kingdom god has given you certain things certain talents uh, certain uh, privileges and positions in society all of those things have been given to you to fulfill your particular plan uh, you know uh, for your life and for the kingdom uh, so you never have to feel that you lack in any way whatever was, was required for your life has been given to you whatever someone else requires for their life has been given to them because all of them ultimately uh, should finally become more and more like christ you know because that's the ultimate goal so we never need to be jealous of one another we can be united uh, fully assured that jesus has taken care of each of us personally what i need i will receive he will provide what the other person needs god will provide to them in his time and uh, i don't need to be jealous of them i don't need to uh, lust after what they have and that is why it says in first timothy chapter 6 uh, verses 6 to 10 godliness with contentment is great gain we need to learn to be content to trust him to an extent where we say yes he is giving me all that i need for my life so i will trust him and be content if anything is more is needed i will ask him and if it is meant for me he will give it to me so uh, you know we can have that walk of trust and contentment when we do that then uh, all these jealousies and disunities and all of that would um, not um, you know take over our lives so um, yeah, I just wanted to conclude with that. Uh, if anyone has any final questions, oh my, we have two raised hands, but we have one more session after this, right? I mean, you guys would have to go to the next class. Maybe we could cover those questions in the next, uh, you know, next Wednesday session that we have. Hold on to the questions that you have uh, because we must not intrude into the next class. Uh, but hold on to those questions, please. Uh, or you can, you know, just quickly post them in the chat and uh, because, you know, they get recorded in the chat and I will address those questions without fail in the next class. Yeah. So uh, right now, um, we'll just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that we could uh, cover today. Oh, Lord, Lord, uh, help us uh, to be united in you. Help us to recognize the provisions that we have in you, uh, the completeness of your commitment to us and your provision towards us so that we don't really have to uh, be jealous or long after something that has not been uh, allotted to us oh lord help us to walk in unity and also lord help us uh, to uh, be in you and have that confidence uh, that you are there for us and to enjoy you more and more oh lord uh, help us not just to look for blessings or uh, material things but enable us to have that spirit of wisdom and revelation where we will start getting to know you in an intimate way and really just enjoy you for yourself and not just for the things which you can give oh lord begin to work these things in our lives even as you have taught us these things and revealed these things to us now help us a lot to actually walk in them to apply them to our lives you make that happen a lot by the power of your name thank you lord in jesus name amen thank you so much uh yeah so in case you have not put down those questions in this chat it's all right hold on to those questions we will answer them in the next class thank you
Thank you. Thank you.